that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm Father Ronald Haft from Our Lady of Divine Providence Family of Parishes. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Friday, March the 22nd, Friday of the fifth week of Lent. Let's begin this hour praying the Miserere, Psalm 51. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offense. O wash me more and more from my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. My offenses, truly, I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your sight I have done. That you may be justified when you give sentence and be without reproach when you judge. O see, in guilt I was born. A sinner was I conceived. Indeed, you love truth in the heart. Then in the secret of my heart, teach me wisdom. O purify me, then I shall be clean. O wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. A pure heart create for me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, nor deprive me of your Holy Spirit. Rescue me, God, my helper, and my tongue shall ring out your goodness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and welcome to this Friday edition of the Sunrise Morning Show here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Anna Mitchell coming to you from the studios of Sacred Heart Catholic Radio in Cincinnati, Ohio. Matt Swaim off today. Paul Lockman at the controls for us. And you can watch the Sunrise Morning Show. Travis Smith has our video feed running and you can find it at sonrisemorningshow.com. Just click on the YouTube link or you can watch over Facebook Live as well. We would love to have you there. Up this hour, Stephanie Mann joins us to continue our series on St. Thomas More's Godly Meditations. And today we're going to be talking about some hard things in light of, um, you know, knowing what Thomas More was like as a person and uh, the things he was willing to give up as he looked toward his death. Matthew Heidenreich will join us. He has just been chosen as one of the perpetual pilgrims in the Eucharistic pilgrimage that will be taking place this summer, uh, just ahead of the Eucharistic Congress. He will be following our Lord in the Eucharist Uh, from Minnesota all the way down to Indianapolis, one of the four routes that will be walked. So we'll get his thoughts on that. We're going to talk about regaining or learning anew the language of Catholic political thought with Ken Craycraft as we start into his book, Citizens Yet Strangers. And then we wrap things up this hour with Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. It is Palm Sunday this weekend, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to usher in Holy Week, and Father will get us ready with a preview of the readings for Mass on Sunday. Right now, it's three minutes past, and it's time for news. The UN Security Council will vote today on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution. The resolution warns against an Israeli military offensive in Rafah, and strongly condemns restrictions that prevent aid from entering the Gaza Strip. The resolution also calls for an immediate ceasefire in Israel's war against Hamas without a time limit and condemns all acts of terrorism, including the Hamas-led attacks of October 7th. Meanwhile, the pastor of the only Catholic parish in Gaza says the people there have endured a relentless Calvary for months now. 
From Vatican Radio, Devin Watkins reports. The situation continues to be extremely grave and worsens by the hour. That's according to Father Gabriel Romanelli, the parish priest of the only Catholic parish in the Gaza Strip. Speaking to Sir, an Italian Catholic news agency, Father Romanelli says Christians continue to have faith and hope in Christ despite enduring relentless Calvary for months. The parish priest of the Holy Family Parish explained how the rest of the population feels greatly disheartened as there are no visible signs of peace or an end to the violence and death. He lamented the terrible toll of the war, saying the conflict has already resulted in more than 32,000 deaths, 12,000 of which are children. Father Romanelli has been stuck in Jerusalem since the war broke out on October 7th, yet he constantly stays in touch with his parishioners in every way. The members of the parish have been taking refuge for months in the parish compound, along with other displaced Christians, totaling about 600, who have lost everything in the bombings. Father Romanelli spoke of reports from inside Gaza, which he has received from his parochial vicar, Father Youssef Assad, who remains in the parish. You cannot imagine the pain we are experiencing and the desperation of the people, said Father Romanelli. He described the scene in the area surrounding the parish in Gaza City with mountains of rubble, garbage, and burst sewers. The rain that continues to fall is a blessing on the one hand, but he said it worsens the hygienic conditions as it causes high humidity and intensifies the smell of decomposing bodies that are still under the rubble. Despite everything, concluded Father Romanelli, Christians are praying for peace every day and offer their suffering and hardships for a ceasefire and the release of the hostages. I'm Devin Watkins. A second flight of American citizens has landed safely in the United States after they fled Haiti. On Thursday, a flight evacuating 80 Americans arrived in Miami. The State Department has encouraged all U.S. citizens to leave Haiti as political unrest and gang violence continues to escalate. For the first time in more than four years, the state of Georgia this week executed a death row inmate. 59-year-old Willie Pyle was put to death late Wednesday by lethal injection after the Supreme Court denied his final appeals. Atlanta Archbishop Gregory Hartmeyer was among those advocating for clemency for Pyle, saying his intellectual disability was not considered during his trial. Life expectancy in the U.S. has gone up for the first time in two years. A CDC report released yesterday found that in 2022, life expectancy at birth was 77 and a half years. The life expectancy rate has not reached pre-pandemic levels, but COVID was not included in the top three leading causes of death in 2022. According to the report, heart disease and cancer were the leading causes of death, followed by unintentional injuries. The head of the Social Security Administration is warning against raising the retirement age. Mark Mayfield reports. Mark O'Malley spoke at a House committee hearing on Thursday where he said Americans want their government to strengthen Social Security and expand it, not to cut it, contract it, or gut its customer service. He added the government should be mindful of people who do hard work their whole lives and die sooner. His comments came one day after House Republicans released a budget proposal that would raise the age of Social Security eligibility to account for increases in life expectancy. I'm Mark Mayfield. And a major upset highlighted day one of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. Number three, Kentucky, was stunned by 14th seeded Oakland, 80 to 76 in the South region. Meanwhile, number six, South Carolina fell to 11th seeded Oregon, 87 to 73 in the Midwest, while fellow six seed BYU came up short against number 11, Duquesne, 71 to 67 in the East. Another six seed went down in the South region when number 11, NC State, knocked off Texas Tech, 80 to 67. Wow, that wasn't even close. The first round continues today with 16 games on the schedule including number one seeds yukon purdue and houston all in action let's see i'm looking at my bracket now on my phone uh i did pick duquesne what else did i did i pick any other i picked new mexico over oh that game hasn't started yet yeah okay i'm sorry i don't know really how to pick oh i did pick nc state yeah i did not pick kentucky i really well, I did not pick the Kentucky game. I really wanted to pick Oakland and just couldn't do it. I should have gone with my gut. Should have gone with my gut. Anyway, 
Today, Friday, March the 22nd. Thanks for joining us here on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's nine past. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Stephanie Mann. You can go check out her blog. It's named after the book she wrote, Supremacy and Survival.blogspot.com. Stephanie, welcome back. Good morning, Anna. Thank you. It's good to have you. And we are nearing the end of our Lenten mini-series on St. Thomas More's godly meditation, which he wrote in his breviary while in the Mm -hmm. tower awaiting his martyrdom. Can you read the section that we will be discussing this morning? Yes. Give me thy grace, good Lord, to pray for pardon before the judge come, to have continually in mind the passion that Christ suffered for me, for his benefits incessantly to give him thanks, to buy the time again that I before have lost, to abstain from vain confabulations, to eschew light, foolish mirth and gladness. Recreations not necessary to cut off of worldly substance, friends, liberty, life, and all to set at loss at right, not for the winning of Christ. Wow. There's so much to discuss here. But the first thing I got to ask is what's a confabulation? (laughs) Well, it's. It's a way of telling a story by creating a, a great fantasy. It, it kind of ties back to what he says earlier in this prayer when he talks about uh, not to think about worldly fantasies. But this is more a way of storytelling. And this is something that Moore did off. I mean, well, you know, his, one of the works he's most famous for outside of his martyrdom and his sanctity is the utopia which is a a a no a story about someplace that's nowhere that he's created this so-called perfect society that doesn't exist and and he is holding it up as a kind of a negative model as many people say and and uh, so this was something he did often was create create stories to tell a truth or investigate a truth that he wanted to look at and he called them they were vain in some ways, confabulations. And hmm. so now he's kind of, it seems to me this part is kind of hard to read because he's kind of divesting himself of everything that made him himself. That he's yeah. there, He wants less of more and so that he can have more of Christ. And it is, it is uh, stunning to read, and especially when we think of it, applying it to ourselves. How do we become, is it really true that we become less ourselves to be more like Christ? It, it is a... Uh, it's a stunning thing to to uh, confront and and think about yeah. and pray about in our lives. I think not Absolutely. just in Lent, but all the time. Absolutely, putting aside not that his confabulations were childish things, but I think about that. You know, when you're facing death, and 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 this is something that really stood out to me. I mean, what do you think he means when he says? Give me the grace to buy the time again that I before have lost. That is also very perplexing. I mean, in one ways, in in some ways, we can see that more in his biographies, they usually indicate that he had some attraction to the contemplative life. He had studied and and had contact with uh, the Carthusians in, in London. Uh, and so maybe he was kind of thinking of that opportunity that he could have had to pray more and to meditate more in, instead of leading an active life with family and friends and working for the government, basically working for the king. Mm-hmm. And so he was thinking of maybe of that. But it is it is a perplexing line because how do you, you can't really do that. I mean, it's like it's like someone saying that you can leave the house late for mass and get there early. <laughs> you're, you're not, it, it's not. It's not going to be possible. Time isn't like that. Right. So it is. It's a perplexing line. Uh, he did have the time now while, while he was in the tower to contemplate more. You know, he did write uh, uh, the sadness of Christ and the uh, a meditation on the passion of Christ during that time, which is what he one of the things that he said he wanted to keep in mind totally. But, yeah, how do you really do that? You, you In some ways you can't. And I think that's, you know, I think uh, – I've heard several sermons or several comments, priests saying or or advisors saying, you know, what have you really done what you wanted to do this Lent? And Mm. this is your last two weeks of Lent. What are you going to do to make up for that? And so that is kind of the question. You know, I was. It is perplexing. 
I, I'm wondering what you think of this, because when I read that line, I started thinking mm -hmm. about deathbed conversions, Stephanie, and, oh. and, and thinking about sin as time lost, and yet having that yeah. opportunity for God's mercy as, as being true. a way to like buy time again. I mean, obviously, yeah. Thomas More was not a deathbed conversion, but right. but at the same time, he was somebody that was was constantly converting his life to Christ, even in these That's final true. moments. Yeah. Well, and when we, if you think about that, you think about the fact that there time is all one for for god yeah he doesn't he doesn't live according to a cycle of time that that passes past present and future is all there for one for him so to if, if there is a deathbed conversion and if someone uh repents of their sin and receives the sacraments of the church and has the prayers of his his or her family and friends god can take up that time that mm -hmm. the person wasted in sin or separation from from him and and heal it in a, in a way you're right that is a the divine a, economy a of yes. time yes. if you will uh -huh. <laughs> yes where uh -huh. where where time really is just i mean we just can't even really conceive the thought of what to be to transcend time in that way but i imagine that that it is kind of like buying time um, he yes. says to, you know, to es to eschew light, foolish mirth and gladness. And and you mentioned this before with the confabulations. I mean, this must have been a difficult grace for someone like Thomas More to pray for. Yes. And I think we I think we have to look at the the adjectives a little bit, the light and foolish. I mean, it's. It, we know that is one of the things through that he also prays for earlier was that even in the midst of his suffering, he could feel joy and gladness in, in Christ and in, in, in God because he's uniting himself, <clears throat> excuse me, more and more with Christ through this through this suffering. So I think that's one aspect of it. But yes, the and, he, and the, in some ways, you have to say we have to admit he, he still did practice this light foolish mirth and gladness we remember his on his uh, on the scaffold he even makes jokes you know about yeah. don't cut don't cut off my beard <laughs> it didn't commit any treason and uh help me up i i can uh, take care of getting down myself you know yeah. so he still sees the the kind of the quirky humor and things but he's still yeah he, he's still thinking about the fact that 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 his uh, life still continues to change even in the midst of thinking of his death yeah. and so i think that's part of his lenten meditations that he offers us is we all know we're going to die yeah. so we all have to be thinking both of how we're living our lives and how we're going to end our lives yeah. in our death well thank you so much stephanie mann you can find supremacy and survival linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. It's 17 past. We're back with headlines right after this. Support for the Sunrise Morning Show is from Visiting Angels. Visiting Angels provides experienced, compassionate care to millions of aging adults nationwide by keeping them safe and healthy in the comfort of their own home. Whether it's a short break for caregivers or for long-term assistance, Visiting Angels provides hygiene, meals, light housework, companionship, and more. And services are available up to 24 hours per day. Visiting Angels, online at visitingangels.com. That's visitingangels.com. Franchise opportunities available. Lord, Teach Me to Pray, the Ignatian Prayer Series, can now train you and others electronically to become facilitators and bring the Ignatian way of prayer to your parish. Come to know and love Jesus Christ like never before and help others do the same. Don't pass up the opportunity to join this work of the new evangelization. Go to LordTeachMeToPray.com and click on Digital Training. That's LordTeachMeToPray.com and click on Digital Training. Did you give up coffee or caffeine for Lent? Be sure to check out the tea and decaf offerings from the Mystic Monks of Wyoming. Find a link to Mystic Monk Coffee at SunriseMorningShow.com. When you make a purchase after clicking our link, we earn a commission to help support the show. The monks also have their seasonal favorite Pascha Java available for you to buy now in anticipation of your Easter Sunday feast. And why not add a Sunrise Morning Show mug to include in the Easter basket? Find those mugs and a Mystic Monk Coffee link at SonriseMorningShow.com. 
Bible in a Year with me, Father Mike Schmitz, is now available right here on Catholic Radio. Encounter God's voice and learn how to live life through the lens of Scripture with a new episode every day. I hope you'll join me as we discover how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz, tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. 19 past now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Let's take a look at headlines. The U.N. Security Council will vote today on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution. The pastor of the only Catholic parish in Gaza says the people there have endured a relentless Calvary for months now. And Pope Francis has sent a message to a group of migrants referring to them as the face of Christ. Next newscast coming up at the bottom of the hour, about 10 minutes from now, as the Sunrise Morning Show continues. EWTN is hiring. Go to EWTN.com slash employment. You can find all of the openings from producing radio or television content to being a administrative assistant to being an on-air um, correspondent for EWTN News Nightly. Go check out all of it. Closed captioning technician? Cool. EWTN.com slash employment. I'm Father Rob Jack. Join me this afternoon for Driving Home the Faith when George Weigel will discuss his new book, The Sanctify the World, The Vital Legacy of Vatican II. Ed Clancy will share the news from the situations of Christians in Peru. I'll reflect on the Palm Sunday readings, the frequent traffic and weather. That's this afternoon beginning at 4 on Sacred Heart Radio. You're on the road to Christ the King. Hi, I'm Anna Mitchell, MC for Heartbeats for Life 5K, sponsored by Cincinnati Right to Life, Saturday, April 20th at Lunkin Airport Playfield. It's a day of food, family, and fun to keep hearts beating in Ohio. Register at CincinnatiRightToLife.org. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Central Fabricators. Central Fabricators is currently seeking welders for their ASME code fabrication shop. They're looking for hard-working professionals who enjoy meeting challenges and surpassing customer expectations. Candidates are required to have experience and fit up in welding. This is long-term employment in a secure, rewarding full-time career with a four-day work week, health care and dental benefits, and paid vacations. More information at centralfabricators.com. That's centralfabricators.com. A wedding is a day. A marriage is a lifetime. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. This is time for a couple to learn about each other and their upcoming marriage. Based on communication, intimacy, and the family they grew up in. Find out more at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. Water damage in your home or business? Plumbing and flooding problems not repaired and restored can quickly get worse over time. Rainbow International of Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can help. Rainbow International, 513-271-1000. With us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Matthew Heidenreich. He is a second-year student at the University of Alabama. We won't hold that against him as Buckeyes fans. Uh, Studying mathematics, he was recently announced as one of the perpetual pilgrims who will be walking to the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis this summer. Matthew, welcome to the show. Good morning. Great to be here. You are a Buckeyes fan, right? That's a complicated question. Okay. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> Never mind. I just wanted to know. All right. So a perpetual, what is a perpetual pilgrim? Yeah. So our role this summer is to accompany the Eucharist, accompany Jesus, um, through the country, so to walk with him in the 60 days prior to the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis. 60 days of walking with the Eucharist. What made you want to be one of these pilgrims that you would apply for it, Matthew? You know, um, I, I've been look, looking back and reflecting on this, um, and I remember stumbling across the Eucharistic Revival 
probably in 2022 when they were first announcing it. Um, and I was just so excited and I felt that this was something so needed for our church. Um, and I remember just, you know, desiring to be a part of it in some way, uh, at that point, not really sure what it was going to look like. Um, and then I, I think probably a year and a half later, her first thing about the pilgrimage and, um, realizing that this is something that the Lord had really like prepared me for and put on my heart, especially with like a deep level of just walking. I'm a huge hiker. Um, and so to be able to, to walk with the Lord, to accompany him, and then also to, to share my testimony, to share my faith with others, um, it was just an incredible opportunity. And I was, I was so excited to hear about it and to eventually receive the opportunity to, to follow the Lord this summer. So uh, folks who've been paying attention to the interviews we've been doing on a regular basis about the Eucharistic revival, we've heard about this pilgrimage a couple of times. And so folks will know that there are four routes that are traveling to Indianapolis from different parts of the country. So which route will you be walking, Matthew? Yes, I will be on the Marion route. So that's the northern route walking from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Indianapolis, Indiana. Nice. Okay. So did you get to request which route you wanted or did you care? I mean, what did you have a favorite route that you really wanted to do? Yeah, part of it was certainly like, um, you know, applying with my preferences uh, and, and getting to submit those. Um, but in the end, it, it was up to the National Eucharistic Pilgrimage um, and their discernment about what would be best for each route, for each team. And honestly, choosing which one was like such a hard decision because all the routes are so incredible and so unique. Um, I know that I, I have a huge heart for the West. I love the mountains. I love being out um in, in nature and the national parks. So, so the Sarah route was super cool, but also I've worked in Minnesota and Wisconsin for the past two summers. Um, so it's also super exciting to be able to return to that area and to continue to serve uh, the North. Very cool. So as you walk from Minnesota down toward Indianapolis, uh, so will you be, you'll, you'll be stopping at parishes along the way and various stops uh, bringing the Eucharist and, and the revival to, to those specific places. Is that right? Yeah. So what are you most looking forward to then? Oh, that's another hard question. Um, I actually just finished visiting um, Mexico City. I just finished a mission trip. So I got to visit Arley de Guadalupe, okay. uh, which is one of the, the married apparition sites in, in our on our side of the globe. Um, and I'm super excited this summer that we actually get to visit another one in the United States, the Our Lady of Champion in mm -hmm. Champion, Wisconsin, uh, one of the only, I think the only approved apparition site in the United States of America. Yeah. So super excited to visit that site. And I know the, the Diocese of Green Bay is expecting a lot of pilgrims to come and join us from that area as well for that specific day. So that, that's a huge highlight of the route for me. That's so cool. And how many other pilgrims will be with you? Do you know? Yeah, so we'll have seven pilgrims with us full time. Um, two of those will be seminarians and then five, six of those, including me, will be will be lay people. Um, and then we'll also have a priest with us the whole time, one of the CFRs who I think um, we'll actually have a group of CFRs who'll be rotating through on our route specifically. And then folks will be joining you as they are able, um, who are not committed to the entire route for the the entire time um, accompanying Jesus to Indianapolis. I mean, Matthew, I, I guess just from a personal standpoint, how do you hope, I mean, clearly, you're already on fire with love for Jesus because you wouldn't have applied in the first place. But how do you hope that that this pilgrimage will will set an even bigger flame in in your heart? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and really, I think it's just the opportunity to draw so intimately close to our Lord and to spend so much time with Him. Um, this really is just going to be a summer of intimate moments with Him. You know, whether that's walking with him, whether that's celebrating the mass, which will also be, you know, very a very frequent part of our of our pilgrimage. Yeah. Um, whether that's encountering him in the people who walk with us and the pilgrims who join us for that day or for an extended amount of time, I think um, just seeing him in each moment and learning to encounter him and to spend that time with him is going to be a huge part of that pilgrimage. 
eucharisticpilgrimage.org is where you can get more information about the pilgrim route. And Matthew, please be assured of our prayers for your preparation and for your walk with Jesus this summer. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. And um, this is going to be an exciting summer. I hope that uh, many of you are going to plan to go to Indianapolis and be a part of the National Eucharistic Congress. Maybe. I mean, go check out the route, eucharisticpilgrimage.org. Maybe you can uh, go over there and join Matthew on the Marion route or the Seton route or the Sarah route, you know, and um, just spend a few minutes at least, maybe an hour, walking with our Eucharistic Lord toward Indianapolis. Very exciting. Half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's time for news. The U.N. Security Council will be voting today on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution. The resolution warns against an Israeli military offensive in Rafah and strongly condemns restrictions that prevent aid from entering the Gaza Strip. The resolution also calls for an immediate ceasefire in Israel's war in, against Hamas without a time limit and condemns all acts of terrorism, including the Hamas-led attacks of October 7th. A second flight of American citizens has landed safely in the United States after fleeing Haiti. Yesterday, a flight evacuating 80 Americans arrived in Miami. The State Department has encouraged all U.S. citizens to leave Haiti as political unrest and gang violence continues to escalate. Pope Francis yesterday sent a message to a group of migrants in Panama referring to migrants as the face of Christ. From Vatican Radio, Sister Francine Marie Cooper reports. The Pope spoke of wanting to accompany them personally and expressed his understanding for their situation. I too am a child of migrants, he said, who set out in search of a better future. He thanked the bishops and pastoral workers who take his place in serving them. The Pope said they represent the face of a mother church who walks with her sons and daughters, in whom she discovers the face of Christ and, like Veronica, lovingly offers relief and hope on the way of the cross of migration. The Holy Father added that migrants represent the suffering body of Christ when they are forced to leave their country to face the risks and tribulations of a difficult journey when they find no other way out. He appealed to the migrants to never forget their human dignity and not to be afraid to look others in the eye, as they are not disposable. He reassured them that they are also part of the human family and the family of God's children. The Pope thanked the migrants for their presence and asked them to pray for him. I'm Sister Francine Marie Cooper. For the first time in more than four years, the state of Georgia executed a death row inmate. 59-year-old Willie Pyle was put to death late Wednesday by lethal injection after the Supreme Court denied his final appeals. Atlanta Archbishop Gregory Hartmeyer was among those advocating for clemency for Pyle, saying his intellectual disability was not considered during his trial. Apple is being sued for alleged antitrust law violations. The lawsuit filed by the Department of Justice, along with 16 state and district attorneys general, claims Apple has monopolized the smartphone market by blocking competitors from accessing hardware and software features of the iPhone. Attorney General Merrick Garland said if left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. Apple pushed back in a statement claiming the lawsuit is, quote, wrong on the facts and the law, end quote. The DOJ also alleges Apple deliberately made the quality of cross-platform messaging worse to incentivize users of other smartphones like Android to switch to the iPhone. A $1.2 trillion government funding package has been introduced by lawmakers as a par possible partial government shutdown nears. Mark Mayfield reports. The House and Senate have until the end of Friday to pass the bill, or there will be at least a short-term lapse. Departments in trouble of running out of funding include defense, education, and the legislative branch. Top lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have made it clear 
They do not want a partial shutdown. I'm Mark Mayfield. Almost half of prisons in the United States are located downstream from water sources that likely contain cancer-linked forever chemicals, as they're known. That, according to a new study published in the American Journal of Public Health, insufficient water quality testing around prisons means officials have only found that 5% of prisons are located in places that definitively contain the toxic compounds, but 47% have at least one presumptive source of pollution in their boundaries. Even within the 5% that definitively contain toxic chemicals, those facilities house tens of thousands of people affected by the water. That's the news on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's 35 past the hour. The Sunrise Morning Show. What we read and think about is what we become. Dominican sister Jane Dominic will talk about literature and life Friday, April 5th at Mount St. Mary Seminary. For more information, visit sacredheartradio.com slash events. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Treating customers with integrity for over 90 years for heating, air conditioning, water heaters, plumbing, and more. Schneller Knockelman at skpha.com. SKPHA.com. Support for Sacred Art Radio is from Andiamo Artisan Bakery in Hamilton's German Village, featuring authentic Italian sweets to grace your table, such as Sicilian almond paste cookies, cannoli, and tiramisu. Celebrate the season with Irish soda bread and St. Joseph's bread. And for Easter, sweet ricotta pies and walnut kolache, in store or online at Andiamo Artisan Bakery.com. That's A N D I A M O. Andiamo Artisan artisan-bakery.com. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Friday, March the 22nd. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air, online at skpha.com. Looks like we're going to be seeing some rain today. Right now it's chilly with temperatures in the lower 30s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, overcast with spotty afternoon showers, but warmer today, a high of 64 degrees. Spotty light rain tonight and an overnight low of 37. Decreasing clouds and some afternoon sun tomorrow, but cooler, a high of 49 degrees. For the Miami Valley, Dayton area, partly cloudy this morning with periods of showers this afternoon, a high of 58. Showers this evening with an overnight low of 34 Cloudy early with increasing sunshine tomorrow and a high of 45 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. It's 37 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Happy Friday. Don't forget, it is a Friday in Lent. That means no meat. Ken Craycraft back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's a professor at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. He writes for the Catholic Telegraph and our Sunday visitor, among other publications. And we are now in the midst of a series on his new book, Citizens Yet Strangers, Living Authentically Catholic in a Divided America, from our Sunday visitor. Ken, good morning. Good morning, Annie. It's good to have you back. And we're going to be talking about the language of Catholic political thought today. Uh, Could you just start us off with a few vocabulary words that would be essential to speaking Catholic in the public square? Yeah, well, throughout this series, Annie, we're going to be talking about Catholic social doctrine. And we're going, and the book is built around the, what I call the four pillars of Catholic social doctrine. And that is the dignity of the human person, subsidiarity, um, the principle, uh, the solidarity of, the, of all human persons, and the common good. And these are, these are not distinctly Catholic. The words are not distinctly Catholic, but there's a distinctly Catholic language that is built up around these words that gives us an alternative moral language to the moral language of individualism that we see around us, which leads to, uh, as we talked about before, and we will talk about again, uh, possessive individual rights, which tell the story that we are all opposed to one another. And that's a language that we have largely forgotten. And I introduced the book in the first chapter by talking about how 
how difficult it is to sustain a language if you don't practice it. And one of the uh, purposes of the book is to point out how we have not, as Catholics in America, we have not practiced speaking Catholic, and therefore, in large part, we have forgotten the language of Catholicism, or what's worse, in some cases, we have replaced the language of Catholicism with the language of possessive uh, individualism, the possessive individualism uh, at the foundation of, of modern um, classical liberal politics. And, and again, I'll remind uh, listeners throughout the series, Annie, because I don't want anyone to be, I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I mean by liberalism. By liberalism, I mean the entire spectrum of American politics from the far left uh, to the far right. Uh, it's all variations on the same basic political philosophy and political language. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we need to think about, and the book calls us to reorient our language and to revive our language, to speak to one another, at least as Catholics, uh, in, in this language of, of, uh, of dignity, solidarity, subsidiarity, and of the common good. And of course, we'll unpack that as we go through this series. Right. Well, the big problem here is like, what do those even mean? I mean, you, you exactly. talk to you and it'll mean one thing. You talk to somebody else it means another. That's exactly right. And actually, the, the way that I uh, start the book, this chapter out, chapter one of the book, is by uh, uh, relating uh, a, a vignette from a favorite novel of mine. Actually, it's a series of novels, 20 novels, in fact, mm. uh, called the Aubrey Matron series by Patrick O'Brien, a British author. Uh, listeners might be familiar with the book Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, yeah. starring Russell Crowe. That's an adaptation, sort of an amalgam of two or three of the 20 novels. But uh, a scene in those novels has struck me, and it actually really got me thinking about this book, in which the these cap early 19th century captain and his uh, surgeon are shipwrecked on an island in the South Seas, and, and they encounter these two girls, young girls who are the only survivors in what appears to be have been a smallpox pox ac ac epidemic that wiped out the entirety of the island except these two. And they didn't speak English, of course, but... Uh, the doctor, feeling compassion for them, took them aboard ship, and, and eventually they sailed back to England after many, many months at sea. And by the time they got back to England, they had forgotten their own language. They were very young, four and five, as, mm. it's, as it's discussed in the book. But they spoke two, <laughs> they spoke two dialects of English, uh, the proper English of the quarter deck and we might, we might call the, the saltier uh, English <laughs> of the below decks or the, fo the forecastle. Uh, and, but, but two dialects of English, but, it, but they never spoke to the, each other in their own language anymore. And this, this led a conversation among Captain Aubrey and some of his staff to say, can you forget your native language? And, uh, and I think that maybe you can, at least some of the vocabulary. And I think what has happened in America is that we've learned to speak the language of the ship, right, the ship of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've become so in, immersed in that language uh, and, and for good reason. I don't blame anyone for this. I mean, we want to communicate, right? We want to be relevant. We want people to understand what we're saying. The problem is, as you, as you just pointed out, the definitions of words that we use are shaped by the foundational moral culture of a, of a particular political community. And the moral culture of the political community of the United States is a language of, of, of liberal, classical liberalism, not classical Catholicism. And so even when we use words like dignity and so forth, many times people mean different things by it because they are informed by a foreign language. And so I begin chapter one of the book by saying, look, we've forgotten how to speak uh, Catholic in the way that these two girls, Sarah and Emily are their names, forgot how to speak their native language. And what we need to do is recover uh, a distinctly Catholic language. Right. Uh, and, and we don't have any hope of it being relevant to the broader culture if the language that we speak is the same language as the broader culture and the words have the same meaning. And, mm -hmm. you know, as an example, Annie, two people who might talk about dignity, one of them uh, uh, believes that dignity necessarily implies that you would never dream of physician-assisted suicide, for example, or euthanasia. And, the same, and another person will use the same word and argue adamantly that dignity implies that you should be able to have a physician-assisted suicide. And so what the book does and, and what we'll try to do throughout this series is to lay a better foundation for the understanding of the human person than the modern contemporary liberal one so that we can start to situate these terms and phrases in a way that 
uh, we can start to recover a Catholic language and start try to remember our, yeah. our own language as we speak to one another. Because, I mean, we are in, what, how many generations on now of, of Catholics who whose parents yes. were were speaking the language of of American Protestantism and and it's like some of us haven't even learned don't even know that a Catholic language exists Ken Boy that's a, that is exactly right and and I it's not so much you know where I teach now in a seminary in fact it really isn't there at all but I used to teach at a, a you know undergraduates at a Catholic university and that's where I first discovered this this problem is that that many American Catholics don't know the language of their own faith tradition. You know, they know they know some words and phrases, but they say them by rote and really don't know what they mean. And again, this goes back to the novel. The novel says that the girls, the only words that they remembered were words that they used to count when they skipped, you know, played hopscotch or whatever on on the deck. But he said, but the the um, O'Brien says they're just rote phrases. They don't even really know what they mean. And and that's I thought that was I think that's a perfect metaphor to start out the book to. Uh, because sometimes we Catholics use uh, Catholic language as a rote phrase. We don't even know what it means. Or what's worse, uh, what we mean by it is not Catholic at all, but something uh, not, uh, not only not consistent with Catholic faith, but in many cases we use language as Catholics that is actually corrosive of our own Catholic faith and witness. And in the meantime, of course, we, we tend to forget our own language. And I'm, 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 I'm hoping that, that I'll make a very small contribution to at least thinking about recovering a distinctly Catholic dialect in, the, in our moral lives, which, of course, translates to all kinds of public uh, policy issues and political lives as well. Well, we will start in on that effort here on The Morning Show with you next time we get together when we talk about the common good. In the meantime, find Citizens Yet Strangers linked at sunrisemorningshow.com from our Sunday visitor. We've been talking to our legal and political analyst, Ken Craycraft. Ken, thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. Looking forward to next time. Me too. Thank you. All right. It is 14 till now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Believe it or not, Palm Sunday is this weekend, and we will preview the readings with Father Hezekiah Carnazzo from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Coming up next, stay with us. Support for the Sunrise Morning Show is from Visiting Angels. Visiting Angels provides experienced, compassionate care to millions of aging adults nationwide by keeping them safe and healthy in the comfort of their own home. Whether it's a short break for caregivers or for long-term assistance, Visiting Angels provides hygiene, meals, light housework, companionship, and more. And services are available up to 24 hours per day. Visiting Angels, online at visitingangels.com. That's visitingangels.com. Franchise opportunities available. Are you looking for peace? Longing for joy? Want to meet the giver of all goodness? God is calling the laity to bring Ignatian prayer into the suffering world. Work for the new evangelization. Go to lordteachmetopray.com. Order your free digital training and manual. Find true happiness and everlasting joy. Go to lordteachmetopray.com and click on the red button today. It's free. Approved by the USCCB. Have you subscribed to get the Sunrise Morning Show show notes? When you subscribe, the show notes arrive in your inbox weekday mornings with the list of featured guests, books, articles, and websites we'll discuss. And then you'll also get the podcast with markers to quickly find and hear an interview again or to see the Sunrise Morning Show on video. So to know when your favorite guests are on, go to sunrisemorningshow.com and click subscribe. This is Conversations with Consequences, where we delve deeper into issues affecting our church, our country, and our core, the family. As Catholics, we need to be informed, aware, and able to talk through some of the tough topics that we're facing in our culture and in our world. Conversations with Consequences gives us the tools to do so. It's not enough to pray. We have to be a light for the world. Conversations with Consequences, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Morning show is Father Hezekiah Carnazzo from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Father, good morning. Can you believe we're looking ahead to Palm Sunday? I can't believe it, but here we are, filled with joy, and uh, it's uh, we're going to be an amazing couple of days and a whole week ahead. And and 
Pasca is coming. The resurrection is coming. I know. It's so exciting. And so this weekend, of course, um, we start with the procession of the palms and the special gospel before the gospel, if you will, um, before Mass begins, really. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today, even though uh, in the Liturgy of the Word, we'll be hearing readings related to the Passion. But we're going to be looking at the Palm Sunday reading, which this year is taken from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. And I guess, really, Father, the the question that I have is, you know, we're gathering and we have these, you know, like one or two palm branches in our hand and we walk around the church and go to our seats. But why do we do that? Yeah, we disconnected as we are from our kind of biblical culture and way of life and expression. It's completely disconnected and sadly so from the power of the of the moment in the gospel text itself and our understanding of what has taken place. And the, the, the first and most important thing is these people knew what they were doing. They were doing this on purpose. Remember last Sunday we were talking about how the whole world had gone after him, right? The, the Greeks start right. showing up and, and, and so forth. And this is part of that progression in which the people of God in Jerusalem are asking themselves, is he the Messiah? That is, in terms of what their understanding was, is he the guy that's going to come in here destroy these Roman soldiers and reestablish the kingdom of David, right? And and now the one who has kind of held back from his public proclamations and his public examples, when he spent a lot of time up in Galilee, comes into Jerusalem, and now this is where we begin to, to see the power of the moment, but also the failure of our modern understanding. Jesus asked for the cult to be brought to him, right, so they could ride into Jerusalem, recalling what King David did when he was on his deathbed, and he called Solomon his son to him and made Solomon ride upon his colt down to the spring of Gihon in Jerusalem to be anointed as the reigning king of Jerusalem. So Jesus almost invites this reaction of the people. And then the reaction is the other thing that's very confusing to us. And that is the picking up of palms and the throwing of the clothes and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, what's going on here? I mean, look, because this was the way, this was the ceremony, the, the, the branches and the carrying of the branches was a reenactment of the uh, inauguration ceremony of the kings of the Old Testament looked like. Mm. They were expecting when the Messiah came that they would celebrate the inauguration of the king just as they had done in the Old Testament through the waving of branches, which itself has a a recollection all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and the chanting of Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the way that the kings of the Old Testament were inaugurated. So when Jesus gets on the colt and and they see what he's doing, he's acting like Solomon, and therefore they throw off Passover for a moment, they throw off Passover and begin the celebration of the inauguration of the king. And this is why the whole of Jerusalem goes into an uproar, because now Jesus has publicly accepted the proclamation that indeed he is the Messiah, and now the Roman soldiers can't take it, now the Pharisees can't take it, and Jesus rides into Jerusalem just like this. This is the most powerful moment, and this is what we have to understand. We're not just going to get a couple of palms, have a blessing, and go into the church. <laughs> you carry those palms as a symbol of the kingdom of God. You are baptized into a kingdom. You are a citizen of a kingdom, and you're not a citizen. No. Yes, we are Americans. Yes, we follow these, these laws, and we appreciate our country. But first and foremost, we are citizens of the kingdom of God and His laws. And his law is the law of love in which, which our life is given for our beloved, is laid down. And this is why the cross becomes the greatest symbol of who our king is. Enthroned upon the cross, he reveals his love to the world, his love which becomes the law of our life as we love God and we love our neighbor. Well, this is so interesting to me, Father. You mentioned uh, how, how Solomon rode into Jerusalem to the spring of Gihon where he was anointed and we don't see Jesus anointed in Mark chapter 11 in in the the gospel account of of his entry into Jerusalem but we do see him anointed in the gospel when we recount his passion no exactly Annie and this anointing 
uh, in the gospel itself is revealed to us as a preparation for his his burial. Yeah. But his but as I say, the cross and burial, his entire passion is a revelation of his kingship. So while it is while it is both an anointing for his burial, which was a which was a, a, a anointing of preservation, and but the preservation of this reality that Jesus is the King of the kingdom, and and this kingship is revealed to him in his life giving death, and that's what's so beautiful about what we're about to proclaim. You know, so many people focus on on the sacrificial or or the suffering of Christ, and this yes, it's beautiful because it reveals to us his love. But, but it's beautiful because it reveals to us his love, and his love is life-giving. The passion, everything he's going to endure, is all oriented at the resurrection. It's all finding its end, its purpose, in that pouring out of his life to all of humanity so that the life of God might be revealed again on earth and man might become a partaker of the divine nature and therefore live forever. This anointing of, this, uh, of, 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 of Jesus now, as king is an anointing of his kingship of not only in Jerusalem but of the whole universe as he reveals to us the gift which he's going to give the life of the resurrection for all mankind. We've been talking to Father Hezekiah Carnazzo and Father I know that the Institute of Catholic Culture has all kinds of resources to enter more deeply into Holy Week coming up. How can they get in touch? I'm going to encourage you to go to the Institute of Catholic Culture because we have a wonderful program this Palm Sunday in the evening with a musical group called Floriani, in which we're going to look at some of the traditional hymns that we sing for the, for, for the Passion, for the Resurrection, um, and, uh, and uh, very ancient hymns, and study them together and their meaning. We're going to hear them sung Palm Sunday evening um, at the Institute of Catholic Culture, instituteofcatholicculture.org. And you can find Institute of Catholic Culture.org linked at sunrise morning show.com. I'm excited to be a part of that evening on Sunday. I'll be leading the pre class discussion. So you can join the the evening. The the actual, you know, singing part starts at eight PM Eastern time, but I will be leading the pre class starting at seven thirty. PM Eastern Time. So hope you can join us over at Institute of Catholic Culture.org. And by the way, go look up Floriani. F L O R I A N I. I was gonna play something for you because we had a few seconds, but I don't know if I'm allowed with licensing fees, so I'm not gonna get anybody in trouble here. But uh, go look them up. They are good. Anyway. We got another hour of the Sunrise Morning Show coming up for most of our affiliates here on EWTN Radio. Family, because of your love for Sacred Heart Radio, we only need to raise another $15,000 to hit our $120,000 membership drive goal. So if you've been considering joining the family to fully participate in the media distribution of the good news, then activate your membership now by going to sacredheartradio.com and clicking Donate or use Venmo at Sacred Heart Radio. Thanks, welcome to the family, and please tell everyone about Sacred Heart Radio and the Sacred Heart Radio app. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Ken Herbert Plumbing, licensed in Ohio and Kentucky. All their plumbers are bonded, insured, drug tested, and background checked for peace of mind. Rated A plus from the BBB. Ken Herbert Plumbing, 513-383-2974. When you donate your car to St. Vincent de Paul of Cincinnati, you are showing your care by making it a vehicle for hope to transform lives. Your donation of a car, truck, or RV helps provide basic needs to struggling neighbors, and they'll pick it up for free. Find out more at 421care.org. Looking for some wholesome family fun this summer? Attend a Holy Family Fest at Catholic Family Land, located 20 minutes outside of Steubenville, Ohio. Mass, rosary, confession, and family-friendly activities combine to create a fun family vacation that provides the perfect opportunity to escape from the world for a few days and reconnect with God together. Financial assistance is available for families in need. Register online at afc.org. Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Merlot, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. When you're looking for an extensive selection of fine handcrafted wines from around the world, it's the BFM Wine Shop on Bridgetown Road. 
BFM Wine stocks over a thousand labels of high quality wine from boutique wineries and small producers. There's also the Wine of the Month, their e-newsletter and pairing suggestions with fine food. The BFM Wine Shop, proud supporters of Sacred Heart Radio, on the web at BridgetownFinderMeats.com. Hi, I'm George Jostin, agent with JC Health, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio. I'm a husband and father of six and a parishioner at St. Catharines, and my mission is to help you navigate the process of transitioning to Medicare. Together, we can review your options and select the plan that meets your unique needs, all at no cost to you. To find out more, 859-414-6591. That's 859 859- Four one four six five nine one. Support for Sacred Art Radio is from Lefke Tree Experts. For residential or commercial tree pruning and removal, brush clearing, storm cleanup, and more, Lefke Tree Experts. 513-325-1783. 513-325-1783. I am Father Rufino Ezama, the Provincial Superior of the Comboni Missionaries. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more or at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word, let us pray. The sunrise morning show. We're continuing our way on this Friday, March the 22nd. It is Friday of the fifth week of Lent. Thanks be to Christ the Lord who brought us life by his death on the cross. With our whole heart, let us ask him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. By your death, raise us to life. Teacher and Savior, you have shown us your fidelity and made us a new creation by your passion. Keep us from falling again into sin. Help us to deny ourselves today and not deny those in need. May we receive this day of penance as your gift and give it back to you through works of mercy. Master our rebellious hearts and teach us generosity. Lord, grant us your forgiveness and set us free from our enslavement to sin. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Hour 2 here on EWTN Radio of the Sunrise Morning Show. I'm Anna Mitchell, Paul Lockman. At the controls for us, Travis Smith has our video up and running, so you can watch the Sunrise Morning Show today. Go to our website, sonrisemorningshow.com. Click on YouTube or Facebook Live. Matt Swaim off today. Up this hour, Dr. James Schrader joins us, and he has a new book that he's put out, From Free Will to Willpower, and... uh, We'll get a little overview of what that means and and how he explores the topic. Father Rob Jack will join us. Uh, He's host of Driving Home the Faith here on our radio station, Sacred Heart Radio in Cincinnati. And he is going to reflect on a few of the last words of Christ on the cross. Bobby Schindler will join us from the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network. This time, 19 years ago, his sister was being starved to death in her assisted living facility. And um, the anniversary of her death coming up in uh, just about a week. So we will reflect on that anniversary with Bobby today. And then we will wrap things up for the hour with Father Jonathan Duncan from the Diocese of Charleston to get his reflections on the readings at Mass for Palm Sunday this weekend. Right now it's three minutes past and news is a service of Central Fabricators and centralfabricators.com. The UN Security Council will vote today on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution. It warns against an Israeli military offensive in Rafah and strongly condemns restrictions that prevent aid from entering the Gaza Strip. 
resolution also calls for an immediate ceasefire in Israel's war against Hamas without a time limit and condemns all acts of terrorism, including the Hamas-led attacks of October 7th. The parish priest of the only Catholic parish in Gaza says the people there have been dealing with a relentless calvary for months now. From Vatican Radio, Devin Watkins reports. The situation continues to be extremely grave and worsens by the hour. That's according to Father Gabriel Romanelli, the parish priest of the only Catholic parish in the Gaza Strip. Speaking to Sir, an Italian Catholic news agency, Father Romanelli says Christians continue to have faith and hope in Christ despite enduring relentless Calvary for months. The parish priest of the Holy Family Parish explained how the rest of the population feels greatly disheartened as there are no visible signs of peace or an end to the violence and death. He lamented the terrible toll of the war, saying the conflict has already resulted in more than 32,000 deaths, 12,000 of which are children. Father Romanelli has been stuck in Jerusalem since the war broke out on October 7th, yet he constantly stays in touch with his parishioners in every way. The members of the parish have been taking refuge for months in the parish compound, along with other displaced Christians, totaling about 600, who have lost everything in the bombings. Father Romanelli spoke of reports from inside Gaza, which he has received from his parochial vicar, Father Youssef Assad, who remains in the parish. You cannot imagine the pain we are experiencing and the desperation of the people, said Father Romanelli. He described the scene in the area surrounding the parish in Gaza City with mountains of rubble, garbage, and burst sewers. The rain that continues to fall is a blessing on the one hand, but he said it worsens the hygienic conditions as it causes high humidity and intensifies the smell of decomposing bodies that are still under the rubble. Despite everything, concluded Father Romanelli, Christians are praying for peace every day and offer their suffering and hardships for a ceasefire and the release of the hostages. I'm Devin Watkins. A second flight of American citizens has landed safely in the United States after fleeing Haiti. Yesterday, a flight evacuating 80 Americans arrived in Miami. The State Department has encouraged all U.S. citizens to leave Haiti. A federal appeals court yesterday ordered the judge who presided over the 2015 trial of Boston Marathon bomber Johar Zarnayev to look into potential juror bias. Attorneys for Zarnayev have been working to get his death sentence overturned for his role in the 2013 attack that killed three and wounded hundreds more. The appeals court ruled that an investigation into whether two jurors lied about having discussed the case on social media fell short of constitutional requirements. The head of the Social Security Administration is warning against raising the retirement age. Mark Mayfield reports. Martin O'Malley spoke at a House committee hearing on Thursday where he said Americans want their government to strengthen Social Security and expand it, not to cut it, contract it, or gut its customer service. He added the government should be mindful of people who do hard work their whole lives and die sooner. His comments came one day after House Republicans released a budget proposal that would raise the age of Social Security eligibility to account for increases in life expectancy. I'm Mark Mayfield. And a major upset highlighted day one of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. Number three, Kentucky, stunned by 14th seeded Oakland, 80 to 76 in the South region. Meanwhile, number six, South Carolina, fell to 11th seeded Oregon. Six seed BYU came up short against number 11 Duquesne and six seed in the South region. And um, went down under number 11 NC State, who knocked off Texas Tech. The first round continues today with 16 games on the schedule. Number one seeds UConn, Purdue, and Houston are all in action. Sorry, I was stumbling over that story. I was trying to scroll through my picks and see. I think I picked everything but Kentucky, I think, in terms of those upsets. Did I get Oregon? Ah, no, I didn't get Oregon. I chose South Carolina. Rats. Oh, well. I'm second in the bracket poll behind my sister Molly right now. Molly's number one. Molly, if you didn't know, you're number one right now. Congratulations. We'll see how it goes. I had Tommy and Freddie do picks. I just, like, read them the names. It's kind of interesting. Freddie has Dayton winning it all, Paul. I think you'll like that. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs>
Today is Friday, March the 22nd. Thanks for joining us here on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's eight past. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Dr. James Schrader. He's online at james-schrader.com. And we're going to be talking about his latest book, which is called Turning Free Will into Willpower, the Opportunity of a Lifetime. Dr. Schrader, welcome back. Yeah, good morning. It's good to have you. Um, My first question to you is, what is the link between free will and willpower? Well, it's kind of an incredible link, right? It's the, you could look at free will as like the potential, as like, for example, the electricity that's available all around. But willpower really has to do with being able to turn the switch, right? Turn the lights on. And, you know, when you think about what the catechism says about free will, you know, the catechism says that, God created man, a rational being, conferring on him the dignity of a person who can initiate and control his own actions. God willed that man should be, quote, left in the hand of his own counsel so that he might of his own accord seek his creator and freely attain his full and blessed perfection by cleaving to him. Mm. Yeah, so our free will is not meant to be like, oh, freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want it. It is the freedom to love God. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the end of the day, it's to pursue God's design in the world and to love him more fully and really, uh, obviously, to open ourselves more fully to him. And I think, you know, what's interesting about this and where we were, you know, this is a project that had been going on for a number of years until the, the book finally came to be published is I kind of recognize that, you know, we as a church body, in it, well, in, in and out of the church, we often tell people, you know, if this is what you should do or this is the way you should live. But we really mm-hmm. don't do a good job, I think, of saying how, right? Yeah. And that's, that's one of the biggest gaps, I think, that exists today and where we really believe that this book can kind of fill and be a great resource is to say we've got to understand the God's design of free will better and we also have to understand how do we use it in every day possible, no matter what resources or experiences you have. Well, give us a little um, a little outline, I guess you could say, of, of how this book is set up. I mean, we're going to be doing a series going through this more deeply, right. but just as an overview. So we did, there's really four parts, and you'll see this whenever you get the book. Um, the first part is to really look deeper into the theology of free will and kind of understand how the theology interacts with our everyday life. So we look at a lot of the current, you know, not just statistics, but current realities that exist, and we look at how that relates to free will and how God designed it. So the very first section is theology of free will. The second is we really, uh, we talk about what we call the freedom elements, and we'll, we'll be talking more about this as we go further. But these these key seven elements are, you think of it as parents, when we're trying to really encourage our kids to use their free will to pursue God, you know, and the love of God above all things, these seven elements are most critical to develop in our kids. And so those are the freedom elements themselves. The third is we looked at the science. So we dove really deep into science. We felt like, you know, we spent years kind of looking in the science, and we brought out what we felt like were really, really key elements that all of us could use every day to develop our free will further. Um, and, you know, it can often get, you can get bogged down in the science. So just like the rest of the book, we try to really make it, you know, an easier, more accessible read um, to be able to pull out these scientific kind of gems. And the, the fourth, and this is actually the biggest part of the book, is it's really the how. So we implement, we have actually the, the acronym willpower itself mm-hmm. speaks to all nine elements that, again, every one of us interact with every single day. And we all kind of, you know, like in some ways might intuit that these are important, but maybe haven't really ever fleshed them out. And so we talk about within willpower, and there's kind of a framework within each of those elements. How do we use them? You know, and and irregardless of resources that you might have or previous experiences, the beauty of this is that there's so many opportunities um, available to us, um, often for free, to use them and use them for our kids and, and use them well. Well, that's awesome. I mean, something that that's really standing out to me as you're talking about this, Dr. Schrader, is that we actually have to intentionally think about this. Um, this is not just something that you kind of willy nilly come about. You you actually do need to work at. I mean, I guess that's where the willpower part comes in, huh? 
Yeah, you're right. No, I mean, I think that we all start to realize, especially when you have kids, that you have to be intentional about these things. And so, you know, you can't just kind of fall backwards and do practices that end up being really good. You have to kind of think through and, and be intentional. But I would say on the other side of it, and this is where we're, we're really excited and it was a lot of fun doing the book, is that there's also so many opportunities in store when you pursue these things. Um, part of the willpower section includes what we call the aspiration. This is kind of like, where, here's where I'm aspiring towards. But you know what? I mean, we're all going to fail at times, right? We're all going to struggle with this, and that's okay. And I think it's so often we get bogged down thinking, oh, this is my obligation. But it's not really what we want to look at as an obligation. This is my opportunity. And, that, you know, we really, really talk about that a lot in the book. This is my opportunity to, with myself or my kids or, you know, whoever I'm, I really work with or love, to see a greater capacity than we might see. And so that, that was a, a fun part, and I think that hopefully really comes through in the book, is that we don't want to get bogged down with obligation when opportunity is really the aspiration that God calls us towards. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's to, uh, I don't know, use a, a, a trite title anymore, but that's that's the power of positive thinking, is it not? I mean, to to think about how this all fits together, it's easy, uh, particularly from a Catholic standpoint. Um, you look at, I don't know, the, the Ten Commandments, for instance, and, and think of them as, as rules, but really what they are are opportunities to live in, in freedom and, and love with God. Um, and, and when you look at it through the lens of freedom, it does become a much more exciting prospect, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. No, I love the way you describe that to the Ten Commandments, because I think that many of us, all of us probably at times have thought, I know, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. And, and while there are what we shouldn't do, it, at the core, it's all about, but wait a second, if you don't do that, what does that unveil? What is the potential? And you start to realize, like, okay, this is the design, right? And, you know, that's what we've always said within our faith. The number one overarching, like, key of all is not to avoid sin, although that's what we try to do, but it's to pursue God in all things, right? And it's the same way here. It's not to obligate, but to give us opportunity. Absolutely. The the book is called Turning Free Will into Willpower, the Opportunity of a lifetime. And Dr. Schrader, if listeners want to pick up a copy so that they can uh, read along with us as we go through the book together, where can they find it? Yeah, easiest way right now is Amazon. And we've got Kindle version and uh, paperback and hardback. Nice. And that's the easiest spot right now. Awesome. And you can find james-schrader.com linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Thank you so much again, Dr. Schrader. We got headlines coming up next here on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's 16 past. For more than 150 years, the Komboni missionaries have served the poorest and most forgotten people. With our founders and Daniel Komboni as an inspiration, we work for the full development of the human person through evangelization, education, and advocacy. Your donations make a huge impact, and 95% are used to fund our many projects. Find out more at kombonimissionaries.org. That is kombonimissionaries.org. For over 500 years, the church-honored spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola have formed many saints. This treasured way of personal prayer with God is now available to you for free. Order your free training manual at lordteachmetopray.com and bring Ignatian prayer to others. Lord Teach Me to Pray is approved by the USCCB. Order your free training manual at lordteachmetopray.com. Lord Teach Me to Pray underwrites the Sunrise Morning Show. Giving up coffee for Lent? Look no further than the Mystic Monks for a great selection of their Mystica tea to get you through the season. And when you shop their site for tea or coffee, after clicking the Mystic Monk link at sunrisemorningshow.com, you earn us a commission. While you're at our site, check out our online store where you can purchase Sunrise Morning Show mugs and travel mugs. Find our mugs and link to Mystic Monk Coffee and Tea at sonrisemorningshow.com. That's sunrisemorningshow.com. As the largest religious media network in the world, EWTN has an important role in educating others about our Catholic faith and spreading the good news of salvation. We invite you to explore our numerous pages of historical faith documents, prayers, teachings, and other current issues in Catholicism today. Visit EWTN.com and click Catholicism. 
EWTN is the Global Catholic Network. 18 past now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Let's take a look at headlines. The U.N. Security Council will vote today on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution. The Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem has said the situation in Gaza is, quote, objectively intolerable. And the head of the Social Security Administration is warning against the raising of the retirement age. You can hear our next newscast coming up in about 11-ish minutes from now at the bottom of the hour here on the Sunrise Morning Show. Um, I was just kind of scrolling through Twitter. You know that um, Matt Swaim is off all this week, um, but he did fill out a bracket, I see, and I'm kind of disappointed that he's off this week. Well, for a number of reasons, but particularly because we don't get to get his, uh, you know, take on March Madness. And he does this, like, magisterial fidelity bracket, you know, where he'll pick a religious school over a non-religious school. And then if it's a religious school versus a religious school, he'll choose the Catholic school. And then if it's a Catholic school versus a Catholic school, he'll choose the one that is, in his opinion, more faithful to the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Um, But... He didn't exactly abide by that because he chose his Tennessee volunteers over St. Peter's, which I think was it last year that St. Peter's was kind of the the Cinderella team. I remember they're the Peacocks, which I love that that's their mascot. I'm thinking maybe the Cinderella team is going to be Duquesne this year, a number 11 seed. They, uh, are in March Madness for the first time in like 40-something years. They are run by the Congregation of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Dayton Flyers are a Marion University as well. Maybe they'll be the Cinderella, number seven seed. Anyway, it's 21 past. In this crazy world, where can Catholics go with their hard-earned money and not support businesses that go against our faith? Check out the Angels List on sacredheartradio.com. It's a list of businesses owned and operated by our Catholic brothers and sisters who underwrite Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. And if you'd like to get your business on the Angels List, email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. That's Leah at sacredheartradio.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Molly Maid of Westchester. Insured, screened, and drug-free employees deliver service with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. 1-800-MOLLY-MAID or at mollymaid.com. Molly Maid, a clean you can trust. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Honda East, the place to find a brand new Honda or pre-owned vehicle with no haggle, no hassle pricing. Honda East, just off I-275 on Beachmont Avenue. Help me, Honda East. The car that I want. Online at HondaEastCincy.com. For over 50 years, the St. Martin District of St. Vincent de Paul has been providing food, clothing, rent, and utility assistance to people in six counties of Southern Ohio. You can join the St. Martin District of St. Vincent de Paul in helping our neighbors with a monetary or vehicle donation, which is simple and easy. 800-322-8284 or donate online at runforthepoor.org. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. What makes this marriage prep program unique is you will have two days as a couple to delve into important subjects that will affect your relationship together for the rest of your lives. More time for prayer and reconciliation and closing the weekend with Mass. More information is at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. Father Rob Jack is joining us again on the Sunrise Morning Show. He is host of Drive It Home the Faith on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio here in Cincinnati. Good morning, Father Rob. Morning, Anna. So we are going to spend the next two weeks together reflecting on uh, some of the last words 
of Christ from the cross. Of course, you could spend hours reflecting on each of them. But uh, to start off, I'm just going to read them off so folks at least know what the seven last words are. Uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. I thirst. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hand I commend my spirit, and it is finished. Now, I'd like to save the last few for for next week, Father, when we're in the midst of Holy Week. But of those first four, what stands out to you the most? Well, the first one really does. Uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What, what we hear in this, the, the seven last words of Christ is Jesus, his whole life has been a proclamation of the kingdom of God and the love of the Father. And we see what has happened. He, he has promoted the love of God. He has called people to love the Father. Their answer has been to crucify him because, again, the human race— uh, can only see love in its own terms. They couldn't see love on God's terms. Right. And so for this, we see Jesus, who has every reason, as uh, if he had our fallen human nature, uh, and only that, to say, Father, I gave them everything, now it's payback time. But they don't say that. He still says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do that in in that sense what we're saying is that the human race could not accept that Jesus Christ is God you know when we think about the passion there are three things that the, that the sanhedrin tried to convict Christ of and they used his own words against him the first of course was his claim to be God because he he seemed to interpret the law in the um, sermon on the mount he said, well, the, you say this, but I say to you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hear that in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we move forward and we see Jesus apparently has a disregard for the Sabbath because he heals people on the Sabbath. And then the last was what we heard uh, two weeks ago in the Gospel, which was destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Yeah. And they use those three phrases as evidence that Jesus is a usurper. He's not really God because he's acting like God. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because <laughs> you would say, okay, well, he's given evidence now that he is the Lord. He's done uh, miraculous deeds. He has uh, done everything to point except he is not the Messiah they wanted him to be. Yeah. Uh, the key to me is this. Basically, they wanted him to be the military messiah in which this king would destroy all the enemies of the Lord so that Israel would uh, would be elevated up to be this, the, uh, what would we say, this, the country or the, the, the uh, civilization of the world. In other words, they expected the king to have a large body count. But in this case, Jesus did not come to inflict suffering on anybody, but rather he came to accept suffering. And to, to the people at that time, with their knowledge of the history of Israel, that's just not acceptable. Yeah. Well, and he also challenged them to recognize their own sinfulness, right? I mean, I think of all of the, the woe to you Pharisees in uh in Matthew particularly, and they just would not accept that. You know, they would not accept their need for repentance, which um, is a marked difference from the good thief on the cross and the second of these last words from Christ. Well, that's true, uh, because again, what we, and of course we know the thief, the good thief, we don't know if he was a Jew or a Gentile. But he's, he's mentioned, of course, in Luke's Gospel. And there, of course, we hear, if you will, the, the, uh, the final temptations of, of the devil against Jesus. We forget in St. Luke's Gospel that after the temptation in the wilderness, Luke adds, the devil left him till another time. In other words, he's not done yet. And when you listen to the response of the crowds 
on at the crucifixion, what do you hear? Are uh, you here? If you're the son of God, come down off that cross and we'll believe you. Well, but here's the thing. He's already done all these great actions and said all these true words, which he has lived out, and they didn't believe him. Remember the story of Lazarus and, and the rich man. Even if someone were to come back from the dead, he won't believe you. But Luke, uh, from such beauty in, in his language and in his phrasing, that now he's Jesus is between two thieves, and there's a whole story, backstory between what we would call, um, we have, of course, Justice and we have Dismas. Dismas is the good thief, and Justice is the bad thief. And both of them are carrying on a conversation with Jesus from the cross. Oh, I mean, what else are you going to do? You're dying. You might as well talk to the people next to you. And of course, Justice is, is speaking with the crowd. You save, you, you know, save yourself and us. But what we hear the, the other the other one, this was saying, we got what we deserved. And then he uses one of the most beautiful lines in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He asks for mercy, and Jesus gives him that mercy. He does. Father Rob Jack, thank you so much. You have a good day, Anna. You do the same, Father. Thank you. And you can find all of our guests, including Father Rob Jack, linked at sonrisemorningshow.com. Be sure to subscribe to those show notes. Half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's time for news. The U.N. Security Council will vote today on a U.S.-sponsored Gaza ceasefire resolution. The resolution warns against an Israeli military offensive in Rafah and strongly condemns restrictions that prevent aid from entering the Gaza Strip. The resolution also calls for an immediate ceasefire in the war against Hamas without a time limit and condemns all acts of terrorism, including the Hamas-led attacks of October 7th. Meanwhile, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem has said the situation in Gaza is objectively intolerable. Vatican News reports Cardinal Pierre Battista Pizzaballa was speaking during an interview on Italian television. He said, quote, we have always had many problems of all kinds, and even the economic financial situation has always been very fragile. But there has never been hunger before. He lamented the weakness of the United States in this situation, saying, quote, until now, there has always been someone to put things in order. Now there is no longer anyone to play this role, and we have to do it ourselves. He said, I don't know if, how, and when this will be possible, end quote. A second flight of American citizens has landed safely in the United States after fleeing Haiti. Yesterday, a flight of evacuating 80 Americans arrived in Miami. The State Department has encouraged all U.S. citizens to leave Haiti as political unrest and gang violence continues to escalate. Pope Francis has sent a message to a group of migrants in Panama referring to migrants as the face of Christ. From Vatican Radio, Sister Francine Marie Cooper reports. The Pope spoke of wanting to accompany them personally and expressed his understanding for their situation. I too am a child of migrants, he said, who set out in search of a better future. He thanked the bishops and pastoral workers who take his place in serving them. The Pope said they represent the face of a mother church who walks with her sons and daughters, in whom she discovers the face of Christ and, like Veronica, lovingly offers relief and hope on the way of the cross of migration. The Holy Father added that migrants represent the suffering body of Christ when they are forced to leave their country to face the risks and tribulations of a difficult journey when they find no other way out. He appealed to the migrants to never forget their human dignity and not to be afraid to look others in the eye as they are not disposable. He reassured them that they are also part of the human family and the family of God's children. The Pope thanked the migrants for their presence and asked them to pray for him. I'm Sister Francine Marie Cooper. For the first time in more than four years, the state of Georgia this week executed a death row inmate. 59-year-old Willie Pyle was put to death late Wednesday by lethal injection after the Supreme Court denied his final appeals. Atlanta Archbishop Gregory Hartmeyer was among those advocating for clemency, 
saying that Pyle's intellectual disability had not been considered during his trial. A $1.2 trillion government funding package has been introduced by lawmakers as a possible partial government shutdown nears. Mark Mayfield reports. The House and Senate have until the end of Friday to pass the bill, or there will be at least a short-term lapse. Departments in trouble of running out of funding include defense, education, and the legislative branch. Top lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have made it clear they do not want a partial shutdown. I'm Mark Mayfield. The U.S. bishops have announced the men who will be heading to Rome to take part in a global gathering of parish priests as part of the Synod on Synodality. The Vatican recently announced parish priests for the Synod, an international meeting, which will take place from April 28th through May 2nd. U.S. bishops will send five parish priests to participate, four from the Latin Rite and one Eastern Catholic priest. And a man is recovering and said to be doing well after receiving a kidney transplant from a pig. Massachusetts surgeons are calling Rick Slayman a real hero for agreeing to try the operation this week. He had previously had a failed human kidney transplant. There's currently a massive shortage of human organ donors. That's the news. It's 35 past the hour. Have you tried using the Sacred Heart Radio app to hear us on your car radio through Bluetooth? It sounds better than FM and is always interference-free. To get the app, just go to sacredheartradio.com and scan the QR code. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Water heaters, plumbing repair, and drain cleaning backed by Schneller Knockelman's 100% satisfaction guarantee. Schneller and Aquaman at skpha.com. skpha.com. A wedding is a day. A marriage is a lifetime. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. This is time for a couple to learn about each other and their upcoming marriage. Based on communication, intimacy, and the family they grew up in. Find out more at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's Cincinnati-Covington.EngagedEncounter.com. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Friday, March the 22nd. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Online at skpha.com. Looks like we're going to be seeing some rain today. Right now it's chilly with temperatures in the lower 30s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, overcast with spotty afternoon showers, but warmer today, a high of 64 degrees. Spotty light rain tonight and an overnight low of 37. Decreasing clouds and some afternoon sun tomorrow, but cooler, a high of 49 degrees. For the Miami Valley, Dayton area, partly cloudy this morning with periods of showers this afternoon, a high of 58. Showers this evening with an overnight low of 34. Cloudy early with increasing sunshine tomorrow and a high of 45 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. It's 37 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Happy to have you along with us on this Friday of the fifth week of Lent. Joining us again on the Sunrise Morning Show is Bobby Schindler from the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network. Bobby, good morning. Good morning, Annie. Hard to believe this year marks the 19th anniversary of your sister Terry Schiavo's death. She died on March 31st, 2005. Uh, I want to talk about 19 years ago today, Bobby. Had she been deprived of food and water at this point in March? Yes. Her her feeding tube, uh, the last time Terry was fed was March 18th, uh, 2005. Uh, So we would be on the fifth day uh, today. Wow. So she, how many, how many days did she not have food and water before she died? Uh, Nearly two weeks, Annie. Okay. Bobby, we've talked about this 
before, but people seem to believe that removing food and water, removing a feeding tube um, is something that's going to allow someone to die a, a quick and easy and painless, serene death. Was that the situation for Terry? No, not at all. And this is why I keep talking about it. And, and I don't want people to forget, not just because of what happened to my sister, Annie, but that this happened, it wasn't isolated. And it would be heartbreaking enough if this was just happened to Terry, but it's happening every single day to people like her and the elderly. And it is one of the most brutal uh, and cruel deaths anyone can imagine. And our family had to witness this for almost two weeks. And, and what's so frustrating, Annie, is... Even today, I mean, Terry, even though it's been almost 20 years now and a lot of people don't remember uh, Terry's case, uh, it still gets reported and compared a lot in our media. And I see a lot of comments and Terry's name comes up quite a bit from people that do remember on Twitter and Facebook. And I, I think people have this impression uh, that uh, they, there was a, a switch that they turned off and Terry peacefully and painlessly uh, 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 you know, faded away, so to speak. Um, like she, she's always, it's always said that she was on life support. Uh, and I try to keep reminding people the life support that the media never seems to want to mention or the artificial life support was simply food and hydration, the same thing we all receive. And if we did not receive it, we would die the same agonizing death. Terry had difficulty swallowing because of her brain injury and needed a feeding tube. That was the only thing that was sustaining her, that was keeping her alive, yet we forcibly removed it from her and deliberately and knowingly starved and dehydrated her to death. And yet we're, what happened to Terry happens every single day, and I just don't know that people realize how frequently and how routinely feeding tubes are removed or denied from individuals. And it's legal in all 50 states today to do that. But the church remains firm that that is considered ordinary care and therefore should not be taken away. That's correct. And, and Pope John, and, and actually Terry's case, uh, triggered a, a clarification that was issued by St. John Paul in March of 2004, about a year before Terry's feeding tube uh, was removed. And in almost every article that I write, and I, and I try to publish frequently on lifenews.com, I try to always mention in there that this one change the wording of feeding tubes from basic and ordinary care to how it is defined now as medical treatment and artificial life support, mm. that change in wording has essentially opened Pandora's box, so to say, and has put so many more medically vulnerable uh, and weak individuals at risk from having to either denied or withdraw. I mean, words are important, and we're seeing a perfect example of it uh, today. And But you're right. The, the Catholic Church has not changed its position. It is still... Uh, feeding tubes are still considered basic and ordinary care, and if someone is not dying, a person is not dying, uh, and they're able to assimilate and metabolize food and hydration, in principle, we are obligated, morally obligated, to continue caring for that person. But yet, it's, it's never spoken about. We never hear clarity from the pulpit. We just don't get educated or, or catechized when it comes to ethical treatment of individuals, when it comes to food and hydration through feeding tubes. Would you say that Terry's death was dignified, Bobby? No, and, and, and again, we, we see it in so much today in this death culture and really the culture that we live and how our vocabulary and words are being defined differently. And they would, they would describe Terry as, as her death with dignity. Annie, if we did this to a dog or any animal for that matter, if we starved, deliberately starved and dehydrated as an animal, it's a federal crime when we go to jail, most likely. But yet, as I keep saying over and over again, we do it every single day uh, to individuals. And it's perfectly legal in, in all 50 states. And depending on what state you live in will depend on how easy. In some other states, it might be a little more uh, uh, difficult. But essentially, uh, it is legal to remove or deny feeding tubes for individuals. And, and again, I, I can never properly describe, even today, when I think about what happened to my sister and how physically... And how she changed, she became unrecognizable, Annie, and she started to bleed in her eyes because she was so dehydrated. I mean, I can get really graphic on, on my physical, the physical condition of my sister and how she was suffering. And I just don't know that people grasp or understand just, just the injustice or, or the cruelty that occurs in an individual when we purposely take away their food and hydration. Well, it's hard 
it's hard to to think about. People don't want to think about it, Bobby, and and would I think rather believe that it was you know a, a quick and painless and and peaceful death, but. But we as Catholics, we as the pro-life community need to stand up for the truth in this matter. And, and you know, I, I mean, I guess it's kind of you to not get to not get so graphic, uh, particularly on a morning show. But um, but these are the things that that could wake people up. Well, I hope so. And that's one of our, our you know, as part of our mission and our ministry is to educate people on this issue. And I and I just, I, I just plead with people to, to educate themselves. Call the National Catholic Bioethics Center if, if you have questions, ethical questions on these types of, of situations. Call us. Uh, we, we can help you. Uh, but please, uh, get information because there's so much inf- misinformation. We want to, our impulse is to trust doctors. And, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't trust doctors, but we, we, we can question. We can, we can go further and educate ourselves and learn, uh, you know, tough ethical questions when it comes to, you know, quote-unquote end-of-life care. But, uh, you know, we know in Terry's case it wasn't an end-of-life situation. It became end-of-life when they took away her food and hydration. So, um, you know, we'll keep working and, and trying to clarify these types of situations. And, um, and you know, we'll, we'll keep reminding people what happened to my sister. Uh, so, you know, um, during these two weeks in, in, in March. Yeah. How are you doing, Bobby? How's your mom? My mom's fine. Thank you for asking. Uh, she still helps with the work that we do, and she, she she still speaks to a lot of families that contact us that, that go through similar uh, situations uh, that experience. You know, when 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 they they a lot of families don't realize that they can be confronted and and have their rights taken away from them when it comes to decisions for medical treatment for their loved ones. So, you know, we just do our best to help families and provide them resources when they're in a situation where they're trying to get care and treatment for their loved ones and, and we'll keep working god willing i mean we've been blessed with so many faithful donors and you know it's only because of what my sister went through that we can we're you know we're blessed to continue to help families and we'll keep doing as long you know god willing as long as we can absolutely i mean we know as as christians as catholics that that god brings a greater good out of every situation we have that trust and Sometimes we don't get to see what the greater good is or don't get to know what it is on this side of the veil. And other times we do have that consolation. And I believe the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network is one of those things, one of those greater goods that we do get to see out of what was just a terrible situation 19 years ago, a tragic one, a maddening one uh, with the death of terry shivo and uh, bobby if listeners want to get in touch perhaps support your organization or uh, if they need more information uh, where do they find you yeah thanks andy you've been a blessing and to our family and organization as well so so thank you it's uh, lifeandhope.com lifeandhope.com linked at sunrise morning show.com bobby thank you thank you manny god bless you you too thanks all right it's uh 14 till father jonathan duncan joins us next Support for the Sunrise Morning Show is from Visiting Angels. Visiting Angels provides experienced, compassionate care to millions of aging adults nationwide by keeping them safe and healthy in the comfort of their own home. Whether it's a short break for caregivers or for long-term assistance, Visiting Angels provides hygiene, meals, light housework, companionship, and more. And services are available up to 24 hours per day. Visiting Angels, online at visitingangels.com. That's visitingangels.com. Franchise opportunities available. Are you looking for peace? Longing for joy? Want to meet the giver of all goodness? God is calling the laity to bring Ignatian prayer into the suffering world. Work for the new evangelization. Go to lordteachmetopray.com. Order your free digital training and manual. Find true happiness and everlasting joy. Go to lordteachmetopray.com and click on the red button today. It's free. Approved by the USCCB.
If you're switching from coffee to tea for Lent, the Mystic Monks have got you covered with a dozen options from your usual Darjeeling and Earl Grey to more exotic flavors like lemongrass mint and blossoming jasmine. Whether you're buying tea or coffee, you can support the Sunrise Morning Show by earning us a commission on your purchase when you click the Mystic Monk link at sunrisemorningshow.com. While you're there, browse the Sunrise Morning Show mugs and etched travel mugs in our online store. Get a mug and link to Mystic Monk Coffee and tea at sonrisemorningshow.com. The Dr. J Show podcast with Dr. Jennifer Roback features some of the foremost leaders and thinkers on issues relating to marriage, family, and human sexuality. You can hear the Dr. J Show as well as faith-filled podcasts from our friends and affiliates across the nation, all in one place, all free at EWTN Podcast Central. Visit EWTNradio.net slash podcasts today. It's 11 till. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Father Jonathan Duncan. He's a priest for the Diocese of Charleston, director of spiritual health at Bon Secours St. Francis Hospital, works in school and campus ministry as well. Good morning, Father. Good to be with you. It is good to have you. So we've got Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion coming up this weekend. Hard to believe that we're about to usher in Holy Week here. And it's kind of a whiplash day for us Catholics when when you think about it. You've got his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the crowd there crying Hosanna to the son of David in that opening gospel. Then presumably those same people jeering at him as he carries his cross to be crucified. And, And in between those two gospels, we hear Isaiah 50, one of the suffering servant, readings, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the great second reading from Philippians 2, Christ became obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's a lot to choose from, Father. What stands out to you in all these readings? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. There is a lot going on, and, and there's a real shift in the liturgy. In fact, um, if some of our listeners uh, are going to be attending a, a traditional Mass, you know, the extraordinary form, in the 1962 rite, it's it's actually very visible because the the priests and the sacred ministers changed the color of their vestments. So mm-hmm. that the beginning of the rite in the in the 1962 is done in red vestments. Um, so there's kind of a, a festive royal sense, and then changing back to the penitential violet, you know, the purple that we're used to. Wow. Um, so there's a there's a kind of like a noticeable shift there. Uh, for those who will be attending an, an extraordinary form mass. But yes, even in, in the ordinary form, the Novus Ordo will have like that sense uh, in the readings, in, in the ship, because the beginning of the liturgy, of course, is, uh, is Hosanna. You know, we sing hymns of praise. The Missal allows us to sing, um, of course, the ancient hymn, Glory allows that honor, uh, all glory, laud, and honor, uh, or another festive hymn to Christ as King. Uh, or sometimes there's chants and and different things. And then, of course, we shift and we hear the Paschen Gospel, uh, which is, of course, so sober. You know, I think, as as I think about Palm Sunday, I'm always drawn. uh, There's there's a few different things that, that speak to me. One, the reality that for those who are merely... Um, intrigued by Jesus, or for those who don't understand fully what he came to do and to be, it's almost inevitable that that leads to um, the cries of, of crucify him. That 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 mysterious turn, and I'm, I'm reminded um, of how C.S. Lewis used to talk about, you know, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Like, you can't really be um, on the fence. And I think as we see, you know, the the beginning of our liturgy is these crowds who are kind of excited, but maybe a little bit unsure. And then by the end of the story, it's, it's either disciples who are fleeing in fear and shame, 
or it's men and women who are crying, crucify him. Jesus demands a verdict. He demands uh, a judgment. And, you know, there weren't any people in that point, at that point in the story publicly who were saying, oh, you know, he seems like a nice guy. Um, we probably shouldn't do this because he seems nice enough. No, it's, it's we're either in shame about this and, and, and sadness or we're crying out, crucify him. So that, that always kind of speaks to me as we see this played out in the liturgy. You know what <laughs> always upsets me um, at, at these liturgies um, on, on Palm Sunday and on Good Friday in particular when they do like – "Quote unquote audience participation," you know, you're reading. Oh along and, yeah. And and I have to say, crucify him, as if I'm one of the members of that crowd. And I've always thought, oh, I don't, I don't want him to be crucified. And yet, well, I do. In 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 many ways, I I I, I live that way with my life as as a sinner. But then also, Father, you think of what his crucifixion means it means that that he's going to pass through death into new life and conquer death through this this terrible form of death that he takes on for our salvation well and i think absolutely like he he steps into uh, and allows himself to be uh, consumed by these all of the like dark powers and, and, and worst instincts um, that are ultimately rooted in our, in our enemy, our adversary, the devil. But all of these powers of like pettiness and jealousy, all of those things are not just individual infractions, but St. Paul talks about, you know, sin is this dark power that's been unleashed on the world because of our rebellion. And so, yeah, when we say crucify him we are acknowledging a reality which is yeah you, you weren't there 2000 years ago but in as much as we all give our lives over give our thoughts our words over to that dark power we are becoming its puppets just like they were 2000 years ago and yet because of it as we hear in philippians 2 Every knee shall bend every uh, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Absolutely. By all those dark powers, in a sense, um, ganging up and, and gathering together against the Lord's anointed, the psalmist kind of prophesied this in Psalm 2, I believe. Because all those dark powers did that, what they didn't realize it was that that was ultimately going to be their undoing and that the son of god was going to consume them instead of simply being consumed by them it's incredible we've got some incredible liturgies coming up starting on sunday with palm sunday and we've been talking about the readings for mass this weekend with father jonathan duncan and father really appreciate your reflections this morning thank you and and a blessed holy week to you thank you you bet all right that'll do it for this friday edition of the sunrise morning show we'll catch up with you again on monday of holy week ushering in the holiest week of the year have a blessed palm sunday ewtn we got another hour coming up for our locals may god bless you and keep you and grant you his peace. Every time you turn on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio, you hear in the words and actions of Jesus Christ just how much God loves us. Yeah, there's no greater peace than to know what God has prepared for those who love him. So we must always try to make his love known to others. To give access to God's love today, tell someone about Sacred Heart Radio. 740 a.m., 910 a.m. and the Sacred Heart Radio app because what can compare to the love of God?
You rely on your car, so rely on the experts at Fort Mitchell Garage, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. They can do it all from brakes, tires, and heating and cooling to towing and collision repair and more. Fort Mitchell Garage on Dixie Highway and Park Hills. On the web at fortmitchellgarage.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Hoding Realtors. The current real estate market is challenging, but the professionals at Hoding Realtors are equipped with the market knowledge and tools needed to make home buying and selling easier. 513-451-4800 and at Hoting.com. Lent is an opportune time to reflect on mortality. Learn more about the importance of the Catholic funeral rites and how to pre-plan. Gate of Heaven Cemetery of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati is hosting a pre-planning seminar Tuesday, March 26th at 11 a.m., 2 p.m., or 6 p.m. Find out why the decision to be in a Catholic cemetery is so important to you and your family. Gate of Heaven. 513-489-0300 and at gateofheaven.org. Every day, members of St. Vincent de Paul Cincinnati answer Christ's call, providing spiritual, emotional, and material assistance to neighbors in need. You can help when you donate your unwanted clothing, furniture, household items, or car. Visit 421care.org. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. What makes this marriage prep program unique is you will have two days as a couple to delve into important subjects that will affect your relationship together for the rest of your lives. More time for prayer and reconciliation and closing the weekend with Mass. More information is at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. Hi, I'm George Jostin, agent with JC Health, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio. Everyone needs effective and affordable health insurance. And if you are turning 65, retiring, or just have questions about Medicare, I can help. I am your pro-family, pro-life guide to Medicare. I can also provide you with a free analysis to uncover a plan that fits your lifestyle and budget. To find out more, 859-414-6591. That's 859-414-6591. I'm Deacon Bill Mullaney from Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new Hear his word, let us pray, the sunrise morning show. 